I like how uh, mellowed out and, and calm the doctor is. Um, I feel like people are often telling me that I'm like that too, and uh, I do appreciate that. I think in a surgeon, that's what you should look for, not someone who's jumpy and erratic and all over the place. What's up guys, Dr. Gary here. So I actually got this in an email from kind of someone random. They wanted me to do a reaction to, should you get a hair transplant in Turkey? Q&A. So this is interesting. I've only watched, honestly, the first few minutes of this so you'll get my honest opinion as we go but the overarching question is is it a good idea for people to travel let's say you live in the United States or the UK is it a good idea to go to, go to Turkey for example or to go to India for a hair transplant you're definitely going to be spending less money but is it worth it there's a lot to say about this topic I'll give you thoughts as we go so let's see how this video plays out hey what's going on guys it's Samir in this video I filmed a little Q&A session with Dr. Zafar the head hair transplant doctor at Vera Clinic where I got my hair transplant from. Honestly, I'm not familiar with this YouTuber whose name is Amir. Seems like a nice guy. I don't I don't know him. And I'm not really familiar with any specific clinics in Turkey. I just, I never interface with them for anything. I just know that there are a lot of them there. There's some good ones, some bad ones, you know, and everything in between. And he is going to be the one translating in between Turkish and English in this video. So basically what I did was I took the questions from the last video, some of the burning questions that you guys have had about hair transplants and whatnot and I presented them in front of the professionals and got them answered directly from there. So if you're considering getting a hair transplant done in Turkey or in general, you guys have answers to those questions. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and roll that clip and uh, I hope you guys find this video helpful. If you do, make sure to give it a thumbs up. I'm going to go ahead and leave the mic with Dr. Zafar. He's the one who did my procedure himself. Uh, so go ahead and introduce yourself, doctor. I like how uh, mellowed out and, and calm the doctor is. Um, I feel like people are often telling me that I'm like that too and uh, I do appreciate that. I think in a surgeon that's what you should look for, not someone who's jumpy and erratic and all over the place. That's good so far. <laughs> So Dr. Zafer uh, Chitinkaya graduated from Istanbul University of Medicine in 2011. So he's been doing hair transplant for the last nine years. Now he is the uh, head doctor in Vera Clinic. I'm curious here, just based on what they said, like was his specialty? I mean, in the United States, we don't have a specialty like for hair transplant. So people choose specific like specialties usually, and then sometimes they'll transition into hair. There are some doctors who choose not to do any specific specialty. They get their medical degree and they just go train with somebody to do hair and then maybe eventually do it on their own. So there are different paths to take. I'm curious, maybe in Turkey, they have a more specific specialized track just for hair transplant. That's just something that comes to mind. Uh, it would be interesting to find out. What are the risks of getting your hair transplant done in a country like Turkey versus just getting it done in your home country other than just the cost factor? Uh, I think that the, the main point is the experience. What, what, what could be seen abroad, whether in Europe or in the USA, is that the doctors over there don't get so much practice. Maybe they have one patient every second day whereas here well the amir asked him about risks right so so far i haven't heard anything about risks he's actually going more into the potential benefits advantages to, to going to turkey as opposed to really elucidating the risks so let's see if he gets into risks because i can definitely think of some risks and then this comment about how doctors here or in europe don't get enough training i mean that's like i don't know like way over simplifying and over generalizing the the situation obviously you have some places where maybe someone has never done a transplant on their own and they're getting into it but you also have plenty of places like myself here you know we do transplants all the time so I don't really like that over just like when people say that you know going to any one country is just the worst thing you can do for hair transplant it's also not fair to say that everyone here in the states or or in, in Europe don't know what they're doing every second day whereas here we get like patients coming from more than 80 countries and we get a few patients in a day so it's, it's again a wealth of experience accumulated again i don't think it's like a country dependent thing i think it's a clinic dependent phenomenon how many patients any one doctor or any one clinic gets it has nothing to do with the country that you're in apart from that uh, i think uh, turkey and especially istanbul has been uh, geared towards this 
a whole sect of hair transplant, whether being the, the doctors who are very qualified and very experienced, but in the same time the whole support team with the, the trichologist and the whole team that comes with it. Again, no matter where you are, the team makes a huge difference and there are well-trained people in many parts of the world, right? And then there are poorly trained people in many parts of the world. Now, I think one of the very important points here is that uh, in Europe or in the USA, there is a limitation for the number of graft that's being transplanted. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the experience again is very limited. Whereas here in Turkey, we've been over the last 10 years experimenting a lot. So we've been pushing the boundaries. And thanks to this, we're doing what we call mega sessions over two days, mm -hmm. where we can get like significant number of graft, maybe like 5,000 or even more than that. Mm -hmm. Right, so, oh man, I got a lot to say about this. So mega sessions right so the concept being that you can take many many thousands of grafts and move them whether it's coming from the scalp whether it's combined with body hair yes it's doable you can physically do it if you have a big enough team if you are willing to spend say two consecutive days which is kind of what they're referring to you can do these mega sessions right of like thousands and thousands of grafts is that a good idea is is the bigger question and and again I, i'm really i'm not happy with how they're like addressing the uk in the United States and Europe and just kind of like saying oh well here we're doing all this and there it's not, nothing to do with the country it's like what his clinic is doing maybe some other clinics are doing that there but plenty of people are doing that here too my personal take on mega sessions and I've seen guys from other clinics and honestly guys from Turkey and and from India who come back and they've had these mega sessions and you exhaust the entire supply of hair in one sort of general session whether it's one day or two days there's a problem there right because you're not leaving any hair for a rainy day you don't know how hair is going to grow out after that individual session yeah you hope that everything's going to go beautifully and it's all going to grow and it's going to look perfect and you only have to do it once right a lot of people are like i don't want to do multiple transplants and whatever but what if it doesn't what if it doesn't and then you run out of all your hair because you've exhausted all of your donor supply then what do you do right and so i see the scenario people come to me for these kind of revision they've had four transplants and they still have areas here that are that are kind of bald but now they don't have hair on their head and now we have to talk about doing neck hair or maybe doing chest or back hair which is never it's never going to grow the same and then when you look at the back of their heads it's like totally bald so now that's a whole different look and now you've got scars from the FUE because most of the time you know they're doing the FUE in Turkey and, and that doesn't look good so there's i think a therapeutic window for anything that we do whether it's surgery whether it's a medication and i honestly don't believe in these super mega sessions and just being able to, to pound your chest to say that oh, i did 5,000 grafts for someone just because you can technically do it doesn't mean that you should be doing it okay so that's just those are my personal thoughts on mega sessions and that's also obviously adding a lot of experience and in terms in Europe or in the USA, the doctors just doing every second day maybe 2,500 graphs, mm -hmm. so they don't get the exposure that our doctors and our medical team mm -hmm. is getting, and then this this is what's really providing the edge. Um, and what you what would you say would be like a con? Yeah, so he just asked them again for what's a con because he initially asked them for risks, and they just kind of went on a whole spiel about all the advantages. The main. Uh, the main negative thing is, is the distance. Mm -hmm. The fact that the patient from the USA has to travel, has to take a few days off and come all the way here. Um, and then here the, uh, the, the follow-up will be done through telephone or through video mm -hmm. conference, mm -hmm. rather than maybe if you were in the USA, it will be face to face. But uh, having been doing this for years and years, mm -hmm. We know exactly what needs to be done so that everything it's it's not a reactive action it's, it's more like a proactive action right and what qualifies a good candidate for a hair transplant procedure this is a very common question right. that comes very often so i don't think that's the only con i think distance is definitely an issue but i think one other thing that really in my mind um, sticks out is just like the medical legal side of things let's say you go to, to turkey or somewhere else and you get a result that you just really aren't happy with and it's just a really poorly done job and let's say we'll go one step further and say that somehow you were injured in the process right you could contract something like a bloodborne illness i mean there are lots of things that could happen anytime you're doing surgery and what actions are you going to take against the clinic that's located in a whole different country with its own rules and laws and everything you're just kind of stuck dealing with that 
complication. As opposed to if you get it done, you know, in the States, you kind of assume that all of your doctors are following state laws, federal policies. There's a level of um, cleanliness that has to be abided and, and you have to like do everything by certain rules. And if for some reason that wasn't done, at least you can take some action against that clinic. And I hate to think about it in, the, in those terms. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a doctor and I don't like to think about all those kind of the, the legal side of things. But I think putting myself in the shoes of a patient, I think it's important to think that way, you know, because you want to stay safe and you want to make sure that that the person, the, the clinic that, that you're going to, like they, that they all have kind of sort of skin in the game and that they there's some responsibility there beyond just like collecting your money and doing your surgery and, and shipping you back. It's definitely a complicated subject. I don't think it's wrong to travel for surgery. I just think you have to kind of take all of this into account. <laughs> Now, the, the, the, here, uh, like the, the the most important thing is is what the pa the needs of the patient, which is di very diverse. I mean, you may have someone who's 20, 25 years old and really see this as a complex, and you may see someone who's 60 or 70 years old mm -hmm. and may need this. So the first thing is the need of the patient. I agree. That That's actually why, you know, I don't love getting emails with like just like a one photo of someone's scalp and they ask like, how many graphs do I need? A lot of it comes down to like, well, what are your goals? Like, what are you hoping to achieve? And, and it's a discussion that you have to have. That's why I prefer like more formal consultations, whether they're in video by video or, or in person. So I do like their approach that they're saying it's about what the person wants and of course what's possible, but you have to take into consideration the, the goals of the patient. So I agree here. This is one way of approaching it. Yani ilk aşamada diyorsunuz ki işte ihtiyacı var. İhtiyacı var. Ama evet. en uygun nedir? Ne zaman yani? En uygun dökülme. Now the, the, the, for, the first part is to understand the uh, hair loss cycle. Ideally, you should do it at the end of your hair loss cycle, mm -hmm. which could be very different from one person to another. Mm -hmm. But here the with the experience what we see is that if you do like a smart planning mm -hmm. and then obviously there are also two factors the, the first factor is does the patient want to do only one operation i mean you can't possibly time a hair loss cycle because the the hair is circling through the si hair cycle at different rates throughout the scalp so you know you, you can't like coordinate it with every single hair so it's not like you can time the surgery to be planned in that way I, there's no one who does that in any um logical sense is he okay to do like maybe uh, two operations or three operations and what the doctor says in terms of smart planning means like you need to take into consideration your donor area mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, just not over harvesting, really doing what's needed at the right age. The guy hit the nail on the head when he said that you shouldn't over harvest, you know, but then when he's talking about doing these mega sessions of 5,000 grafts, unfortunately, you will be over harvesting in those situations. So, you know, you can't have it both ways. Do you want to not over harvest and preserve hair for the future when the person might still need it? Or do you want to offer mega sessions when you're doing 5,000 hairs and treat people that way? Like it's, it's very hard to, and to go between those two worlds because it's a totally different strategy and approach. Why don't you do us all a great big favor and pick a bloody side? Obviously, if, if people, uh, you know, patients are 20, 25 or 30 years old, mm. they see there is a complex, there is a need for it. It's right. urgent. Right. They're young, they want to solve that problem. Mm. So to tell them to wait maybe until 35 or 40 is maybe not the solution. Mm. Therefore, doing it with taking the precautions and doing it in a smart way might be the right way. Can you speak a little bit about your uh, current technology that you have compared to you know most traditional practices? Like you mentioned, uh, Sapphire FUE mm -hmm. versus traditional FUE, the Oxycure PRP laser therapy. How does all of that equate to uh, getting the optimal results versus a, a traditional procedure? Um, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to answer this as a medical consultant. Now, the, the, the first thing is that the Sapphire technique uh, was a technique that was invented uh, from Vera Clinic uh, back in 2017. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why this is the technique that we always mainly use it. What are the main advantages of the Sapphire technique? It's, it's a faster healing process. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's providing like a more natural look mm -hmm. and also it's providing a higher density. Mm 
-hmm. Yeah, so, you know, this whole concept and people, I think, trick um, patients into, into booking for surgery when they throw out certain terms that maybe they have and others don't have. And I think a lot of uh, us, including myself, are guilty of that in one way or another and to try to kind of differentiate yourself. But just so people understand and not to confuse them when it comes to like sapphire, all that's talking about is the actual recipient blade that's used to make the, the site. When you're making all the sites for the hair of where it's going to go, you can use different things. So some people say, oh, well, we're special because we offer DHI implanter pens. Great. In other place, like these guys are like, oh, well, we offer these sapphire FUE. So everyone's like, oh, wow, sapphire FUE. But what it comes down to is the actual item that's used to just make a hole into the scalp of where the hair then will fit into. There are many different ways to do it. Every surgeon has his or her own preference. And there hasn't been a clinical study that has shown that one is more effective than the other. So this whole bit about, oh, faster healing time and all that, show me a study that compares that versus traditional sort of custom cut blades, which is what I use, versus implanter pens, versus needles. There's actually a study that shows that whether you use blades or needles, there is no difference in how things will pan out in terms of the regrowth of your hair. So again, a lot of these terms get tossed around and as this has nothing to do with Turkey. This happens in New York, this happens anywhere. People are just throwing out terms without truly explaining to patients like what it is that, that it's doing and how it's different or how it's just maybe their preference and it's not that different from other techniques. Again, the OxyCure is a, is a, is a technology that was invented uh, a year and a half ago from Vericlinic. Um, the, the main thing about this is that you get actually two sessions where you're put into a special chamber for about an hour and a half to two hours where we give you a lot of oxygen, an oxygen that you wouldn't be able to get in normal time. And the fact that you're oxygenating your blood, this is helping to get a faster healing process, but also, and most importantly, helping to get a higher survival rate of the newly transplanted graft. So again, they're talking about some form of a hyperbaric oxygen chamber that they're throwing patients in for a couple of sessions while they're there for their transplant. Again, show me a study that compares doing that versus not doing that at all, and the actual results from a hair transplant being any different. There is no such study. One of the main points in hair transplants is, is a good circulation of blood. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you have more oxygen in the blood, you get a better circulation mm -hmm. of the blood, which is strengthening the, the, the, the, the grafts uh, mm -hmm. in the process. Again, it's the same principle. One of the, uh, the, the, the founding pillar theories of hair transplants is that to have a good growth of your hair, you need a good circulation of blood in your head. Mm -hmm. Now, the laser therapy, what it's doing is it's providing a certain level mm -hmm. of uh, laser, laser, laser light, light, of course, yeah, I'm going to pass forward. Well. And then, we have two ways of doing it. We either inject it on top of the newly transplanted graft at the end of the operation, or we just we spread it, we inject it on top of it. Yeah, and okay. that again PRP. is really helping for two things. The first thing is like a, a much better uh, healing process. Mm -hmm. and, and most important... Again, most people are doing again, some version of most of these things. All right, well, this is kind of going into some more specifics of hair transplantation and moving away from, you know, should you really go to Turkey or, you know, or any other country that's far from your home for a hair transplant. So let me summarize with this. I think that there are certain parts of the world where standards are extremely high and the rules are very strict. I'm not gonna say where those places are because I don't wanna offend anybody, but I think you guys can figure that out. And if you you have a surgery, whether it's a hair transplant or any other surgery, it should give you at least some peace of mind that things are generally being done properly because there's some degree of oversight. There are other countries, other clinics in, in countries where that oversight may not be quite there. And should you run into a problem, you might be in trouble and there might not be much of a recourse for you. Okay, so you have to kind of weigh that against maybe saving some money on transplant. I don't think you're gonna find any special equipment in any one place that you won't find anywhere else. You know, these guys are using some advanced stuff. We use advanced stuff. Everyone's got their own thing. Everyone's trying to get the best results. Clinics that focus on hair, you know, obviously already get great results and they're just trying to always, you know, do something that, that improves that and, and that that's fine. So I think it's easier to just kind of stay 
put where you are in your country. If there's ever an issue, you can go back to that clinic more easily. If there's a real problem, you can report it to you know the, the, the state or federal sort of bodies that are involved with that. So you know, that can give you, you know, just they could just calm you for, for when you're going for a procedure that's invasive. That's sort of my general opinion on it. I don't think there's anything too special about Turkey specifically. I think there are some great clinics there. I think there are great clinics in many different parts of the world. And the other thing I'll tell people is I think you should really be picking your surgeon. Don't just pick the clinic. Don't pick the country. Pick the doctor. Make sure you understand who your doctor is. Will they be there on the day of your surgery or are you just going to get stuck with someone else? Like it's not the same. You're, if your doctor is involved with the surgery, it's not going to be the same outcome whether it's him or her or just some other random person that they throw in there. Trust the doctor. Trust that they've built a great team around them. And I think you're setting yourself up for success. Hopefully that was helpful. Make sure to like the video if you guys enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.